it's fun to celebrate all that's happening, as Kim mentioned to us. And let me just uh, mention one thing before we jump into the sermon this morning. Uh, on that note of the Cure Project, Cure, you might have noticed on the screen, it said Cure Serve the World Project. Perhaps you're newer around here or uh, you just haven't heard this before, but Serve the World is the way that we talk about expanding our impact beyond our walls. Some churches use the term missions, but I think we're te- we tempted to think of missions as somebody else's job. All of us are called to serve the world around us, locally and globally. And so we uh, have a separate giving destination called Serve the World. And a couple of times a year, we tell you a story about a Serve the World partner, a local or a global partner, in this case, Cure, to uh, have you pray for them. And should God move in your heart, give toward their ministry efforts. Uh, and when we give above and beyond, and by the way, our goal over the course from, from uh, BBS till now was $150,000 to outfit a surgical center and pay the salary of a cure uh, surgeon for one year. And you gave 100000 plus more than that. So praise God for that. I want you to know when you give more, which frequently happens around here because uh, God has been gracious and you've been generous, that money, we can give more to cure than they even planned on receiving, and we can bless our other Serve the World partners, locally and globally, who are also doing remarkable work. So in case you're wondering, where does the money, extra money go? Doesn't go to me, doesn't go to the Chapel Street Church, doesn't go, uh, it goes straight to our cure partners and other partners like them. We give it all away uh, for the glory of God and because we can do more together than we ever could on our own. So let's bow once more and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for the worship we've been a part of, proclaiming uh, who you are, that you are a king, and there's no one like you, and you're good. And now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us through your word, because even though sometimes we ignore it or resist it, we, we need to hear what you have to say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been working our way through the book of Proverbs, applying it to specific areas of our lives, the pursuit of wisdom, God's divine wisdom. Wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom is God's word, divine insight, rightly applied to our earthly lives. Maybe the art of living well in light of God's truth is a good definition, a working definition of wisdom. Uh, And today we're talking about wisdom and friendship. Do you ever think back over your friends, uh, over your life? Do you ever stop and think back over the good friends you've had over the course of your life? Anybody do that? How far back can you go? You remember your friends when you were five? Did you have best friends? Six, seven? Your childhood friends? There's a movie, uh, this will date me a bit, uh, called Stand By Me, 1986 movie. Anybody seen that movie? Fantastic. Oh, my people. Right, they'll be like, what? (laughs) Uh, In that that movie, uh, Richard Dreyfuss is the narrator. He's telling the story of his childhood friendships. And there's a great line. Um, In fact, it's, uh, it's the last line. Uh, of the movie, and he's typing it. You see it on the screen, it's not spoken. He said, I never had friends again like I had when I was 12. Does anyone? Can you think of your your 12-year-old childhood friendships? Billy Sudbrook was one of mine, down the street from me. Who were your friends when you were 12? Um, There's another line in that movie, maybe you can think of your friendships in your life that have come and gone. They move in and out of your life, and he's got another line in the movie when he says that happens sometimes. Our friends come and go out of our lives like busboys in a restaurant. I think that's true sometimes. We move, they move, we drift out of connection. Maybe this isn't your story. Maybe you'd say, hey, I've got great friendships now. If that's true about you, you would be in the minority in our culture. Statistically speaking, you would be in an extreme minority. I think we have what I would call a problem of friendship in our culture today. As Facebook friends and social media contacts and those that we are connected with and know about their profile and their pictures abound in our lives, our, our access to true, deep friendships is diminished, culturally speaking. Our ability to make, keep, and forge deep and abiding friendships is waning in our culture today. Social scientists are increasingly talking about something they call the epidemic of loneliness. Anybody heard this phrase? An epidemic of loneliness. In fact, in the UK in 2000, April of 2000, this year, 2023, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom uh, established a new cabinet minister called the Minister of Loneliness. What a weird title for your job. He, he works by himself all the time. No, excuse me. <laughs> to deal with this real mental health issue. The loneliness and isolation and disconnection is having profound impact on people's physical health, mental health, emotional health. In our own country, the the Survey Center of American Life in 2022 did a study on this, and 49% of Americans say they have less than three close friends. 
12% of Americans say they have zero close friends. By the way, that was only three, less than 3% only 30 years ago. It's quadrupled in, in, in three decades. So we're disconnected, isolated, lonely, and we need true friends. But I would suggest we lack the resources to find and to forge true friendships. According to God's word, you cannot be truly wise without true friendship. How do you think, maybe so, but my life would be easier without all the people? Anybody think that? <laughs> maybe you're not putting your hand up. Sometimes I think that. Ministry would be easier without all the people. <laughs> it also wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be a thing, right? Sometimes we can, but that's, that's not friendship. That's just the pressures of all the relationships we have to manage and the stuff going on in our lives. The fool, according to Proverbs, thinks, I can make it on my own. The wise person knows, no, I can't. I need people who know me and who love me and who love God more. Proverbs 18, verse 1, puts it this way. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Whoever isolates himself or herself is foolish. You're breaking out against sound judgment. Proverbs 13, verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So the, over and over again, the Bible tells us that we suffer for a lack of friendship and for poorly chosen friends, the wrong kinds of relationships in our lives. When we're young, our friends are kind of chosen for us, like by proximity, right? When you were a kid, who were your friends? They lived on your street in your neighborhood, or you played ball with them, or you went to school with them, or you were in dance class with them, or whatever. They're the people that you were just around. My daughter, Hannah, who's, uh, she, she's always been the tallest in her class. Like in her, in her grade school pictures, it was like a little kid, little kid, teacher, little kid, little kid, Hannah. Like she's always been tall. And one of her friends was a little girl who was very small for her age, and Hannah used to carry her around the house when they would play. I'm like, Hannah, don't, don't carry your friends like dolls. You know, <laughs> She'd be mortified if she heard me saying that, right? But when we're young, we just, our friends are there for it. When you get a little older, adolescence, you're like in middle school, you, you try to choose your friends. But the criteria is what? Who's cool? Who are the, what's the in crowd? In my day, it was the cafeteria table. Like if I could get close to their orbit, closer to that table, I was uh, inching my way toward, you know, being acceptable. As we get older, our friendships, if we have them, our relationships are really more transactional and uh, ob obligatory. So if we, people, and I think this is especially true. I mean, all of us suffer from this, but I th in my observation, in my own life, and as a pastor, is for men. We buy the lie that we can make it on our own. I got enough to do with my job and my family. I don't need more. Relationships are hard. They take work. I can barely manage my own marriage. I don't need more people to talk to and share my feelings with, right? The reality is that true friendships are both discovered and developed. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. And Proverbs says that we need to pay attention to both. You'll see an image on the screen here of a group of friends. Anybody take a guess on who these people are? You're so smart. Or, just, or you just know me too well, maybe, yeah. Um, okay, so this person here is, yes, it is C.S. Lewis. And this person here, anybody know? J.R.R. Tolkien. This is Charles Williams and Owen Barfield. These four men were part of a group called the Inklings in Oxford in the 1940s. And the, day, the Inklings was a kind of a double entendre. They wrote poetry, myths, stories, and essays. And so they wrote with ink. And Inklings meaning thoughts. They had ideas they shared together. Lewis and Tolkien became very good friends. Maybe you didn't know this about them. Perhaps you did, that Tolkien and Lewis became good friends. And Lewis talks about Tolkien's influence on his own journey to faith in Christ. For over four decades, they were, they were met twice a week with a group of friends to encourage each other. Tolkien said of Lewis, I would never have written the Lord of the Rings trilogy had it not been for the constant encouragement of Lewis. I would have given it up. But did you know that Lewis didn't actually like him when they first met? Here's what he wrote in a letter to a friend about meeting him of Tolkien. A smooth, pale, fluent little chap. No harm in him, really. Only needs a smack or two. <laughs> and they became dear, dear friends. 
This is a quote from Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. The Four Loves is the four Greek words for love. Eros, phileo, and then you know, romantic love, brotherly love, and then agape being divine love. But phileo, philia, is the Greek word for brotherly, or friendship love. Here's what he writes about this kind of love. Lovers are always talking to one another about their love. Friends hardly ever talk about their friendship. Isn't this true? When you're in love, in a romantic relationship, you talk about our relationship. But when you're, like, as my friends, I don't get together with my friends and say, how's our friendship going? We're just friends, right? We don't talk that way. Lovers are normally face-to-face, absorbed in each other. Friends are side-by-side, absorbed in some common cause or interest. That is why those pathetic people who simply want friends can never make any. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Friendship must be about something. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. In fact, the Lord of the Rings epic, those three books, which I, I, I love to nerd out about with a few of you, this whole story is what? It's a journey taken by friends, the fellowship of the ring. They're on a quest together. And so for Lewis and Tolkien, this friendship was their common love of mythology and writing, and, but ultimately speaking, it was Christ. And so as followers of Jesus, we have the ultimate cause out of which to form friendships and forge them. We're going somewhere together, and we need each other on that journey. There's a huge distinction here between this and acquaintances or companions or people on your social media profile. Proverbs 18, verse 24, puts it this way. This will be our central text as we work through a whole bunch of different passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 24. We can go to that verse real quick. There we are. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. Whoop, that doesn't make sense. That's the wrong. 18, 24. I'll read it to you. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Note the distinction in that verse between companions, plural, and brother, singular. Two different Hebrew words actually used. Re'ah is the word for companions. It means like a a fellow person, companion, other individual. But the Hebrew word achev for friend means intimate, confidant. So I want to talk to you about three things as we put into practice in our friendships And we pursue them in our friendships, meaning how you choose and how you develop friendships. The first one is the pursuit and practice of friendship. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. One of the central qualities of true friendship is faithfulness and dependability. A friend is somebody who shows up. You know, there are some of us who you, you, you're with somebody that you love and care for deeply, and they're in trouble. They're hurting. They're grieving. They have a heavy heart. They're facing difficulty. And you say things like, call if you need anything, right? Don't call, hesitate to call me if you need something. Well, that's a good thing to say. But the deeper level of friendship is what? You don't wait for the call. You just show up. You're just there at their house. You're just there in the hospital. You're just there at their door. You're just there because they need you and you anticipate what they need. You don't wait for the call. The pr- pursue and practice faithfulness in our friendships. That, this means, by the way, uh, you don't really know who your friends are until what? Until you go through some stuff. Until you need them, until things are difficult and hard, until there's pressure in your life, until you find out who stays, who shows up, who doesn't walk away. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother or sister is born for adversity. This means all kinds of times, not just when things are good. You know the story of the prodigal son when he leaves home and he's got his inheritance and he's got lots of friends in the beginning because the money's flowing and there are high times and he squanders it all and he's left penniless and what? Alone with no one. The second thing is pursue and practice kindness and care. Kindness and care. Now you might be thinking, well, that sounds like 
be kind, be nice, right? But there's something profound here. This is not on the screen, but uh, Proverbs 26, verse 18 says, like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. What a, what a statement. Like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death. Meaning, uh, harsh words, deceptions that harm someone, and they say, oh, I was only kidding. Now, you've read the book, The Five Love Languages, some of you. Do you know that book? My wife and I think there's a fifth language called sarcasm, <laughs> which we both speak fluently, you know. And that's okay. I mean, good friends can poke fun at each other. Good friends can jab each other, and that could be a sign of friendship. But it's never meant to hurt someone. It's never meant to harm you, to belittle you, to diminish you, to deceive you, or to hurt. And then just say, oh, I was only kidding. Meaning, a true friend cares deeply about the needs and the feelings of the other person. I think about how will this impact them. Proverbs 25, verse 20. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. What's that about? You might think, well, singing songs to a heavy heart, what's wrong with singing songs? It doesn't mean like uh, calming, soothing songs for somebody. It means you come across a friend who's hurting, and you show up all happy clappy. That's like taking off a garment on a cold day or pouring vinegar. It's the wrong thing. It's not what they need. The, the point is that demonstrates a disconnection from what your friend needs. So the point is true friends understand what my friend needs. What do they need right now from me? They need my presence, they need a kind word, they need just my silence sometimes. Can you be super happy when your friends are sad? Parents understand this in a different way. Every parent in here knows the truth of this statement. When you become a mom or a dad, you are, for the rest of your life, only as happy as your unhappiest child. When they're hurting, you're hurting. You can't escape it. And that's true in friendships as well, real friendships. If you can sort of unplug, well, that's their issue, and I go about my life. A true friend cannot be detached from their friend's needs. So you celebrate their wins because they feel like your wins too. You genuinely want them to succeed and you're glad when they do. And you grieve their losses because they feel like your losses too. You're that connected. Proverbs 17, verses nine through 10. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he repeats a matter, separates close friends. That means you're, you protect your friend. They, they let you in. They share with you what's really going on, even things that might be offensive or hurtful or harmful. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows to a fool. So good friends, don't keep records, don't hold grudges, don't keep a little pocketbook with, yeah, but you, six years ago, remember what you, <laughs> I do that in our marriages sometimes, don't we? I remember uh, not that long ago, a couple months ago, sitting at my desk, looking over some notes for a sermon, and out of the blue, God brought someone to mind. Has that ever happened to you? And here's the context. A few months earlier, I had been in a meeting with this person, and I would spoken harshly to them. I think technically I was right, but I was wrong in the way I said it. Very wrong. I said harsh words. And in the moment, I knew, like in the moment, I know I shouldn't say it that way. But I didn't say anything about it. We moved on, and I forgot about it, because I got busy, and I just forgot. And then months later, sitting at my desk, God brings that to my mind, and I thought, oh, we haven't connected. I haven't talked to them. I bet they've been harboring a, a resentment or I've hurt them. And so I <laughs> grudgingly to the Lord went and to this person and said, hey, remember a couple months ago when I said, I'm really sorry, that was wrong. And they said, oh, I forgave that the moment it happened. We're good. We don't keep records, we don't speak harshly, and when we do, we seek forgiveness quickly. Proverbs 11, verse 12, is not on the screen, but it says, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. The truth is, sometimes being a good friend means knowing when to shut up, knowing when to close your mouth and just be there. True friends know when to speak, they know when to keep their mouths closed. And last, pursue and practice truth-telling. Of course, everybody in here wants a friend who's faithful and who shows up, right? How many of you would prefer your friends to be unfaithful and never show up? 
right? We want friends that are gonna be there. And everybody in here wants friends that are kind and caring, that speak encouraging words, that don't harm you, that, that are trustworthy. We all want that. But how many of us say we really want a friend who always tells us the truth? I don't mean lies. Like we do tend to think, well, I don't want someone lies to me. But I mean, how many of you want a friend who is willing to get in your face from time to time and to speak the hard things to you? If we're honest, I think some of us don't want that. Proverbs 27, verses five through six. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of of an enemy. This is a fascinating verse. There's a lot in this. The people in your life who are truly for you are not the ones who always tell you what you want to hear. Those are the ones you gravitate toward because it feels good. But the people in your life who you can truly count on are often the ones who tell you things that are hard to hear. They love you that much that they'll tell you the truth. I love the phrase, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The NIV translates it, an enemy multiplies kisses. Right? An enemy tells you, is always giving you nice things. Think about that. How many of you have ever thought this? Well, I love her too much to say this to her. It would hurt her. If you've ever thought that, what this proverb is saying is, that actually is the most unloving thing. And you're behaving more like an enemy than a friend when you withhold the truth. That's hard to hear. We tend to think, yeah, but you don't, he, he's not gonna listen to me anyway, and I got my own issues. Who am I to say this? And she's, the truth, the Proverbs are saying, if you are a true friend, you don't withhold the truth because you know they need it and you love them enough to say it, regardless of how they'll respond or whatever your own issues are. And we need this in our lives. I need this in my life. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Why would a true friend ever wound you? Why would you want to wound someone? Because they love you, and they love you, but they love God more. And they want God's best for you. And that means sometimes it has to hurt for you to see the truth. Frederick Buechner wrote a number of books. Uh, uh, one of them is a novel about a 12th century English hermit, holy man, named Godric. The title of the book is Godric. <laughs> He's got a great line in there. He says, what is friendship when all is said and done but the giving and receiving of wounds? I can trust the wounds of a friend because they're given in love. A true friend speaks the truth. By the way, Judas betrayed Jesus with what? A kiss. Hidden love is not love at all, is the point in this proverb. Proverbs 27, verse 17, this, this verse which all of you will know if you didn't know the reference, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. A couple months ago, I was in the gym that I go to in Batavia, and this guy, big guy, he had this cut-off black T-shirt on the front. It had a skull. Instead of crossbones, it had cross dumbbells. And on the back, it said, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And he was like all tatted up and huge and swole. And so I, I was like, I, I went up to, I'm always looking for ways to talk to people, which, anyway. I said, hey, man, I like your shirt. He's like, thanks, bro. And he said, <laughs> I said, do you know where that verse comes from? He's like, yeah, I do. It's in Proverbs. I said, no way. I thought it'd be like a chance to share Christ with him. He tells me this story that when he was at his lowest, making terrible decisions, blew up his marriage, estranged from his kids, a friend shared this verse with him and said, I want to sharpen you. He said that was the beginning of him turning to Christ. His name's Wayne. I hope he comes here someday. It was awesome just to talk to him about that. As iron sharpens iron. Last, as we close, the power of friendship. We began with the problem, right? The problem of friendship. We have a problem in our culture, finding and forging true friends. And the truth is, when you read through this list of Proverbs and the descriptions of an ideal friend, and we've only touched on a few, I have a couple reactions. Maybe you have the same. One reaction is longing. I want those kind of friends in my life. I want people like that, that, are, that, are, that I can count on in all seasons, that'll tell me the truth, that are for me at the deepest level, and for God's work in me, not just what I want all the time. And the second reaction I have is kind of a conviction that I'm not that kind of friend often enough. I'm distracted. I don't respond quickly enough. Do you have that, those feelings, longing and conviction? So the question then is, how are we going to find a friend like this? And how are we going to be friends like this? Proverbs gives us a couple of clues. Proverbs 28, verse 13 Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. 
but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Think about that for a minute. No human friendship can set you free from your sin. I mean, I can forgive you for offense done to me. I can come alongside you when you struggle, but I can't liberate you from your own junk. I can't forgive you like at the deepest level. I don't have that kind of mercy available. But there is a friend, Proverbs says, who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24, again. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who will never let you come to ruin if you trust in him, who you can obtain mercy from, whose wounds can be trusted. Isaiah 53 tells us, by his wounds we are healed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. This friend, his wounds are the most faithful because he not only gives them to you in telling you the truth, he receives them on your behalf. He takes the wounds that were due to you because of your sin. And you know the name of this friend. This is, the Proverbs is really pointing us to Jesus, the friend that sticks closer than a brother or a sister, the friend from whom we can obtain mercy, the friend who is always for us, who will never deny or betray, who shows up and is always there, who tells us the truth even when we don't like it, who believes the best in us and knows the best about us even when we don't. And when you, when you discover the love of this friend, it sets you free from having to try to get that from some human being who can't give it to you. And you can be that kind of friend for other people. And some of you can, you can come to church for your whole life and not know the friendship of Jesus. We sing songs about being the friend of God. What a crazy thought that is. Friend of God. God? Yes, because of the love of Jesus Christ made known to us on the cross, you can be a friend of God. He invites you in. Here's how Jesus puts it in John 15, our last verse this morning. Jesus says this about his disciples and about us, those of us who know him and trust him. Greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Do you notice the definition of a servant? You're just doing the job. You don't really get why. You don't understand the reason. I'm just got a job to do. But I have called you friends. Why? For all that I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. Here's what he's saying. I have let you in. You're invited in, into the inner circle with Jesus. You're called a friend. But you're not just a servant doing whatever he tells you. He's let you in. He's inviting you in to the heart of the Father, to what his purpose is in the world. And that friendship, that at the core of who you are, sets you free to be the best kind of friend that the world needs. Let's pray. Father God, I, I know there are people in here who know you intellectually, know about you, believe in you in that way, but have never received this relationship, this offer of deep and abiding friendship. And Lord, for all those who this, 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 that describes, I pray right now in their heart in this moment, they would turn and trust you and know you as their friend the friend who will never leave, never forsake, the friend who gave his life for us and in whom we have life, the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our friend. We pray this in your name. Amen. In this service with that last line, lead me in your love to those around me out of friendship with the one who is the greatest friend of all. If you're here this morning, you'd like someone to pray with you or pray for you for any reason, we always have members of our prayer team right back there in the prayer room that love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father and the peace and grace of the Son surround you and fill you now and forever. Amen.